All right, if you will, turn to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. There is a lot before us this morning, so I need to not get lost in a long introduction, so we're just going to jump in. If we have seen that uh, Paul's heart for the churches in Crete, as we've been studying, so he, he writes to Titus, put things in order in the church. Run the church the way the creator of it has designed it, and the purpose is to put on display a saving God to show forth the glories of Jesus Christ to this dark and dying world. And so we have seen, he said, there's a need to appoint elders, and they need to teach sound doctrine in a way that has changed their lives and therefore is changing others' lives. It must be a truth that transforms. And these elders are to build up the church of God on sound doctrine and to teach it day in and day out patiently. Don't grow weary in it. Silence false teachers. There needs to be a purity of truth in the church so that we could grow up on it. There needs to be a purity in the body life where we practice discipline for unrepentant sin in our midst. And there needs to be a gatekeeper on the membership that you testify of redemption as you come to join the body of Christ. And so what this does is it makes for an atmosphere for discipleship relationships then to blossom and bear fruit and to build each other up into godly men and women. Life on life, it is, it is beautiful what Paul is laying out for us in Titus. And so I said last week, this is the apologetic of Christianity. Lives that proclaim to this world, we worship and serve a God who saves. Our lives silence the critics instead of fuels them. Do you want to be that kind of a person? Find someone who's walked with God and knows Him and is manifesting it in their life. Get up next to them. Get around their family's coffee. Get into each other's lives. Someone said, I don't know if I'm supposed to approach them or if they're supposed to approach me. And I got a simple answer, yes. (laughs) Just go. Okay, go. There's no set way to do it. Just everybody engage and go in a culture that thinks and builds and pours into each other. We need each other to grow so we can put a saving God on display. Look with me in verse 11. This is where we left off last week. Titus chapter 2, verse 11, 4. Um, That's not how you start a sentence. It doesn't stand alone then. It's building on an argument. And I've seen this verse preached so many times. Don't miss that 4. You could translate it because. In verse 10, Uh, Don't be pilfering, showing all good faith at work, employees, so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. Therefore, for, show forth then now a saving God. Why? Because He is a saving God. He is a God who saves. This is Christianity. It's not I know a bunch of things. I've been saved. I've been saved from death and, and hell, and I've been brought into a relationship with the living God. This is the... Christianity, this is the foundation of all that Titus 2, 1 through 10 sits upon. Everything we've been studying, it sits right here. This is what the four is for. How can I be this kind of older man? How can I be this kind of older woman? How can I be this kind of younger man or younger woman that we've been studying and looking at? How can I pour into someone and then they will actually grow into the likeness of Christ? How can I work like we saw last week? And the answer is uh, grace. Paul's going to give us the answer. Is We could study those things and look at them forever and nothing will ever happen. And he says, here is the empowerment. Here is the way this is going to take place. It is grace, grace, God's grace. This is the foundation and fuel of it all. This is the glue that holds the church of God together. This is why we will be a light in a dark and dying world is because of grace. The grace of Almighty God. And so I want to begin with prayer. Every one of us, let's take our hearts before God for this grace. Father, we come before you and we have been studying your word. And apart from your grace, it would just command us to do things. And we would never be able to do it. But now, Lord, you give us wings and you give us uh, freedom in Christ and strength and empowerment now from the very God himself. Lord, we have grace, deep, flowing, abundant grace. And I pray this morning that you'll open our eyes to see it clear and more beautiful and that that would be the the atmosphere of Southside Bible Church, people who 
are taken up with grace. People who live in it, they live in enabling grace as they abide and commune with the living Christ. Oh God, the fruit that will flow in this uh, building will be so beautiful. It will flow into the nations. And so God, we look only to you. We don't look to our own hands, our own strengths, our own plans, our manipulations. God, we look to you alone for grace. We need you to do this in our midst. And I thank you for it. I thank you that you are a God who is gracious. If you weren't, we would have no hope. So God, we praise you. And we worship a gracious God here this morning corporately. Amen. Well, grace, it's a very hard word to define. It's so big and encompassing that it takes a whole Bible to define it. And then Paul says that's just a mirror dimly. So we look at it, we love it, we treasure it. And it's just all we're, all we're seeing is in a mirror dimly the grace of God. One man said grace as a mnemonic. It's God's righteousness at Christ's expense. Another one we all grew up with is it's God's undeserved and unmerited favor. One man said God's free merit to bless sinners eternally. Uh, I, I like saying it's uh, he's able. He's able. And I bet some of you have some great definitions of how you've tried to get such amazing truth into words. And all of those have some beauty to them that I just read. Yet in our text, it's not so much a word to be def uh, defined, but you know what Paul does? He, he personifies it. I'm not going to put it into words, but rather that the word became flesh. <laughs> Michael Card wrote a song. He spoke the incarnation, and so was born a baby who would die to make it mine. It's, here it is. Here is the word. You want to understand grace? Then look at God incarnate. Just look into the face of Jesus Christ. The attribute of God that is called grace has been made manifest in the Son of God. Look at Him. You want to see grace? Look at Jesus Christ. He is grace personified. He is where we see it, find it, understand it, uh, receive it. And I love what Paul says. The grace of God has appeared in verse 11. It, it has appeared. That word means it's become visible. The grace of God the eternal word has come and, and come onto this earth. And we see this grace all wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. Grace is personified in the Son of God. I want you just to listen to a couple thoughts here. Uh, Paul wrote to Timothy in chapter 1, verse 9. He said, He saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus. It, it, grace, is, it's, it's been appearing. He's appeared and He's brought it and He's shown us. And in Titus 3, in the next chapter, He says, but He personifies kindness. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared. So, so grace is personified in Christ, kindness, and His love for mankind is personified in Jesus Christ. He appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. And so I want you to just hear that grace shines in the face of Jesus Christ. John said that word, that eternal word, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and that word became flesh, and it dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me, for out of his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace so that the fullness of Christ, it's just like layers and layers and rivers and rivers of grace that overflow him and we drink living water and we feed off the grace of God that flows from Christ. It has appeared. That word, I don't know why that hit me so hard this week. The grace of God has appeared. I hope you see the beauty of this. We're moving into the Advent season here very shortly. 
And this was an actual event in the history of this world. It was in a literal place with a governor, given time, a given point. A babe was born in a stable and he was laid in a manger. And that little bundle was that the grace of God has appeared. He has appeared. God has done something in history which unleashed his grace. Salvation has come to us because he came to us. And so this isn't a fantasy story. God has appeared, came to earth. And that's why we gather and that's what defines everything about us. This morning, the grace of God appeared. And who was this? Well, in Titus 2, 13, it says it, it was our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. And it just takes your breath away. It was our great God who was born in a manger. He's appeared, the eternal everlasting God making his descent into a lowly manger. Wesley said, mild he lays his glory by where he was worshipped and adored. Born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail thy incarnate deity. I just hope your hearts are overwhelmed this morning. He, he has appeared. He has appeared. The grace of God came. Amen. And he walked this earth. And, and there were little flashes of his glory where he would heal someone. He, he, he would raise the dead. He would cast demons out and they would listen. The storms, he would say, shh, and they would just be quieted. And people would say, who is this? That, that's, there's something glorious. This, this doesn't happen naturally. That's supernatural. Who is this? This grace personified then walked the earth and at the end, it was tried, and it was mocked, and it was ridiculed, false justice, and it was led up Calvary's hill, where he was nailed to a cross between two thieves that taunted him, and the crowd taunted him, saying, you saved others, but you can't save yourself. And he just looked so defeated. But he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. He died in our place for our sin on that cross. And he gave up his spirit and he bowed his head and said, it's finished. And they took down his body and they, they buried it and they rolled a stone in the, in the tomb. And everybody went away in defeat. And on the third day, Mary came running saying, he's risen just as he said, come see. And they come and the grave is empty. He's conquered death. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. That isn't just doctrine. That, that is the greatest reality that is known to mankind. He has appeared, and he's bringing salvation to all men. The grace of God appeared. He gave himself for us. He appeared. And so I want you to look back to the historical event that has changed the entire course of the world and take it in and just see grace personified. And I, I think of... Simeon, he, he said, you know, God says, you're not going to die until you see the Lord's anointed one. And that day, another day, like every other day, that old man walks into the temple, and there he is, he sees him, and he comes and he picks him up, and he says, behold, thy bondservant can depart in peace, for my eyes have seen thy salvation. The grace of God personified, my eyes have seen the instrument that God is going to use to bring his grace into the world. Let me depart in peace. And that is the glory of who we are and what we are this morning. The grace of God has appeared. I want you to notice something else very important to Christianity is it's not enough just to look back. It's not what we just looked at. It's so beautiful, but that, that's not it. If we want to live these godly lives that put this salvation on display, remember the whole context. This is lives that are going to show a saving God. And if we want to do that, we have to put our focus and our minds and our eyes and our thoughts in two places. We have to look back to that glorious thing. His grace appeared, but I've got to look forward to His grace is going to appear again. That is the only way to have a present godly life that is zealous for good deeds in verse 14. So if you want to be zealous for good deeds, if you're dead, you're cold, you don't care, your problem is you need to gaze again at the grace of God that appeared and the grace of God, the glory of God that's going to appear a second time. 
So Titus 2, 1 through 10, if we're ever going to get those kind of relationships, it's because we're a people taken up with a God who has appeared bringing salvation and a God who's going to come and settle it all and consummate all of history. That is the only way we're ever going to be this kind of a people. This isn't a moral cleanup, fix up, be a nice guy club. It's a group that's taken up with the two comings of Jesus Christ. There are several ways that I see people in the church missing this, where we just look back and all we do is we live in past grace, and, and that's all we're about. And all we think about is, is the past grace that came in Jesus, nothing more, nothing about the present, nothing about the future, and you live any way you want, and you usually live awful and lawless because all I am is in grace, nothing else matters. That is going to be a big mistake. And then there are those who just look at the here and now, Christianity is all it's offered is what it gives me now. It's, it's Christianity is I'm going to love and I'm going to make a difference in the world and we're going to focus on discipleship and we're going to do all these relationships and that's all we're going to be about and the church just lives and focuses on that. And the third one is a church that just looks at eschatology the end times, and we spend all of our time looking at the return of Christ and getting these perfect eschatologies of every nuance, and you'll fight and beat on each other over when Jesus is going to come back and make all things new. And so you can just be in a church where that's all we talk about. That's the only focus. And I'm telling you, in Titus, none of these alone will ever get you a Titus 2 life. None of those in isolation will ever produce what Paul is after on the churches in Crete. It will never get you a whole community called the church. Uh, adorning, the, that, that word adorn means cosmeto. And I'm going to leave that alone for examples this morning. <clears throat> it means adorning the gospel of a saving God, making it look beautiful and Showing forth the beauty of what happens in a life that has been saved by God. So look back. Look back often and deeply and meditatively and understanding. Just stay, look, gaze at the cross, live into the cross. A marvel at the grace of God appeared bringing salvation to all men. And be a people who keep looking forward on a daily basis. Could today, could today be Maranatha? Come, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, this could be the day. I keep my eyes. My hope is not my kids graduating high school. My hope is Jesus Christ returning and making all things new. Verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus. We're a people caught up in both of those hopes. We look at both. We live in them. We think. We build our lives. They're, they're, they're everything to the believer. Jesus Christ this morning is at the right hand of God presently in victory. And he is coming to this earth again. And you cannot stop at his first coming. So many like to leave Jesus as a cute little baby in a manger and how cuddly he was and the angels singing. That is not very threatening. But I want you to look at the difference between these two comings in our text. In verse 11, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. It's, it's, it's for all men right now. This is the issue. Christ has come, bringing salvation to all men. By coming in humility and dying on a cross, cursed is everyone who hangs on a cross. Jesus Christ hung cursed for us on a tree. But the appearing, he says, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. So one, he came like a little lamb to be slaughtered, and the other, he'll come as the lion of Judah. There is no greater contrast than the two appearings of Jesus Christ. It just, there, there's, there's no greater contrast. The first and the second coming of our Lord. The second coming will be visible just like the first appearing. It will be here on this earth. But this time he will come in glory, and he says full glory. And this time it's not going to be eclipsed with a, a, a veil of flesh. He's going to come for all to see the radiance of God's glory in Jesus Christ. And it will not be that we should not look upon him because there's no stately form or majesty 
as the first time. This time, he's going to come in glory. And when he came the first time, he would give little glimpses. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John, they see him transfigured. The flesh pulls back, and they see it. Paul, going to kill the Christians on the road to Damascus, got a glimpse of that glory, and that man was never the same based on that glory. In Revelation 1, John gets a vision. I preached on it at Easter. Uh, and you just see him in all of his glory and radiance and beauty of that portrait in Revelation 1. And John falls as a dead man at the presence of it. And so the second coming, everyone will see his glory. Every eye shall see him in, in a blazing, uncovered glory. He's going to bring an end to the day of grace that he initiated at his first coming. That was manifested at his first coming. And the free gospel that has been offered for thousands of years to the nations and even to your own heart here this morning of pardon and adoption, it's going to come to an end. There, there's a day of grace and it will come to an end. And he will come to judge the living and the dead and going to judge the world in a perfect righteousness. And all the books will be opened of your lives and he will destroy all of his enemies. And those who rejected him and spurned his free offer of grace will be cast away for all of eternity. But he says, for the believer, we're looking for the blessed hope. We're, this is a blessed hope for the believer. And it almost can show if you've been born again is whether it's a blessed hope or just something that has you terrified and you don't want to think about it and you busy yourself in this world. You turn up your music in the car so loud you can't think because I don't want to deal with this. Don't, I don't want to think about it. Don't talk to me about death. You, you're, you're bothering me right now, Pastor. But for the believer, it's like this is the blessed hope. This is what I live for. This is my dream. This is where my eyes are fixed. Where he's going to come and he's going to bring in a new heavens and a new earth where, where in, uh, righteousness dwells. And sin and evil and shame and everything that is wrong with this world will be gone and it will be banished. And everything will be new and it's going to be glorified. And that is the blessed hope of every believer. It's not to make Denver paradise. The hope of the believer is what Jesus is going to come and usher in at his second coming. And so I just want to ask you a simple question. What is it that you're waiting for? What, what is it that you're waiting for this morning? And I pray that your, your greatest burden is you're, you're waiting for friends who will love you. You're waiting for that job that you've always dreamed of. You're, if I could just get this one spouse, this, everything would be perfect. If I could get that house on the hill. And some of you, your hope is retirement. And we talked about that last week, so I'll leave it alone. Retirement. Is that what you're waiting for? Be honest before God. Is that your blessed hope? If it is, you will never live the way Titus 2 is instructing us. You're going to keep giving me excuses why you won't do Titus 2. And I've heard a bunch of them. And when he appears, you're going to be sad that you use those excuses. When you've seen the grace of God appeared and then it's going to come again in glory, it makes you zealous for good deeds. And all these excuses, they're just not going to work. They're not going to work. We live godly lives because we're looking at two things. We're looking at the cross that has a wonderful attraction to me. I'll cling to the old rugged cross until I exchange it one day for a crown. I'm going to hold it and look to that all my days. And I'm going to look at the blessed hope of the new heavens and the new earth. And I'm going to see them. I'm going to see them with my own eyes and be glorified. This is the way that we will live godly and righteously. This is what is to fill our heart. This is what sound doctrine teaches. This is what our relationships must encourage as the foundation of life and godliness. If we just spend time together and that isn't what we're locked on, we won't help each other. The, the beauty of engaging lives and pouring into each other is that we're caught up in those two advents. And that's what we're feeding and encouraging and helping each other to live godly in this present age. To remind each other that the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. To remind one another that the glory of God is going to appear soon. It's eminent. And he'll make all things new. That is the blessed hope. 
And the failure of our age is that we are taken up with this age. We've failed. Christianity has become a religion that helps us live happier lives in this world. I want sermons on stress. All all I care about is what will make this life easier and better and, and just more usable. And we get God's blessing so that life will go well. And we're about helping people right now. And I'm not against that, but I'm against just that. About making life better. We don't want to leave it. I don't don't see many people who want to leave it. I'm so busy trying to make it better and easier, I don't ever want to leave it. We fight so hard to stay. Our blessed hope is life, liberty, and justice for all. Some of you are falling apart with this president thing. Stop. Your blessed hope has never been a president of the United States, and you know that. Quit fighting and arguing and trying to take each other out with arguments of who's a better person as president. You're all wrong. (laughs) It isn't this. And that is why we're not showing forth the world a saving God. That's why they're not wanting to say, I want to know this God that saves. There's something so radical about you people. Your citizenship is in heaven. You don't fear and worry and run around wherever the stock market is is where my hope is. You're a people that just you're different because your citizenship is in heaven. We look back at a cross. It didn't purchase us an American life with family and homes and educations. That isn't what the cross did. It isn't that we deserve a country that holds up our constitution and will fight it. America the beautiful. No, that's not a blessed hope. We have a blessed hope that causes us to deny ourselves in worldly desires. The secularism of the church, the secularism of our church, is going to kill us. So I start with a finger at my own heart and, and at some of yours. That isn't what Christianity is for. That's why we're not zealous for good deeds. The two appearings have not done the proper work in our hearts. If this life is our hope, then Jesus' appearing the first time meant nothing. He didn't come so that we could just have life right here. We're waiting for what he's going to usher in. We have it already, but not yet. So let me close out with one last thing. The clock's broken, so I may go way over. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> so I want to close out with one last thing that we should look at. Is that we, we need to look at the first advent, and we need to look at the second one that's a coming. But it, this is important. You need to look at yourself, and that's kind of the opposite of what, we might, what I preach half the time is you look at yourself too much. But th- in a different way, we need to look at ourselves. And the question is, how has the gospel then come to you? What, what, is, what is the gospel meant to you? Has it done anything to you? Is it just some cold facts? I've had someone say, my, my testimony is I used to believe in evolution, and now I believe in creation. That isn't salvation. It does something to us. It teaches us something, if you'll look with me in Titus 2.12. The grace of God has appeared And it it instructs us to something. To deny ungodliness and worldly desires to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So it it instructs us. It does, it it teaches us. That word means to teach. It was like a a, a trainer or something. Teaching someone, training them. It it teaches us something. So that the gospel is to teach us something. And so the question is, has the gospel taught you something? Because if we have seen his appearing... All of our views and thinking and philosophies and purpose and ideas have completely changed. My eyes have been opened to what life is, the whole thing, and that has to affect you. That has to instruct you how you think about life, what you exist for, why you're here. If that hasn't happened at the first appearing, you've missed it. That first appearing instructs us to get this. What is my life about now? It instructs me about my way of living. It has to change. As a man thinks, so he is. And I have a whole new way of thinking. The lights have been turned on. 
I can look at the way somebody lives and I can almost tell you their philosophy of life. Just by watching what they do, I know your philosophy. And so I ask myself, what does his first appearing then mean to me? Is it just like reading a novel where you look and you can see all the events and the action and you love the thrill and you're just following it, but you know it really means nothing to you? You're not in the book. It's just entertainment. Is this all just some facts that you're not in it? You're not a part of it? It's just a story that you read in a book? What does this mean that Jesus really entered this world and died in my place? It tells me that I was in such a bad state. If I'm ever going to get right with God, if I will ever get reconciled to God, I was so bad, God had to send His own Son into this world to save men. I was under the wrath of God and I was absolutely incapable of saving myself or He would have never left His robes and come to earth. There was no help for me. That's what it teaches me. It instructs me that there could have been no hope then if God had to send His Son. The Son of God had to leave glory for me. Have you realized the significance of this to your life? Have you made that deduction in your own heart? And the second thing that it instructs us with is then what is your view of time? That, that's this, this time that we're in now that God has given to you. How do you view time? How do you view your life is what Paul's talking about. And he says in light of that coming, it instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. We understand the meaning of life now. For us, history is the period between the two comings of Christ. He came and He's coming again. That's the way we look at life and time now. Time is God giving to the ungodly time to repent. This time right now is the season to gather in the nations, to bring in the Gentiles while the Jews have been hardened. That I look at time that we exist for the ingathering of the Gentiles. We live in the day of grace. This is the day of grace. Christ purchased it on Calvary's tree. We proclaim it. We get out there. We do it. It's going to end. Remember in Noah's day? I mean, just eventually that ark closed and they knocked and when the storm came and no, it's done. The day of grace has ended. Have you realized the significance of the continuation of time? If you're here this morning, it's, it's for you to receive the grace of God if you never have. There's a reason for time to receive this grace that has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. This is time to help others to do that. The meaning of time is gathering a people, he says, for his own possession in verse 14, who are zealous for good deeds. That's time. Eternity is coming. The day of grace will end. The only thing that matters, are you in Christ? And is He in you the hope of glory? Is God in you? And are you in Christ? Is that your view of time? Or is it how the one with the most toys wins? How can I do this? How, I mean, what is your view of time? Have these instructed you, the grace of God, to view life this way? If it is, listen to what it should instruct us then. How do I live on earth? I deny ungodliness. That word means to reject or to renounce. I renounce ungodliness. Ungodliness is a reverence to God, a life that does not worship and serve Christ. I, I deny that kind of a life. I, I, I push it off. I run from it. I reject it. I renounce those things. Anything against God, I, I deny it. And I deny worldly desires, which is the flesh, which every one of us have. And this remaining flesh, it, it, it's that desiring the things of the world that will comfort my five senses. And so you, you, you can't be a person that all you're about is how do I bring pleasure to my five senses. I, I deny fleshly desires. I, in our day and age, in, in the church, people have quit holding this. It's like I can live any way I want. And he's saying, if you've seen the grace of God, it causes you to deny these worldly desires. I, I have something bigger than my flesh. I have this coming, and I have a second coming and, and that's how I can turn away from these things that are tempting me to get my pleasure right here and now and the reason they're winning is because those other two things aren't winning and if I see them that way I, I can turn from all this slop and junk that's being thrown at me and trying to draw me in on a daily basis the two advents caused me to not have to grab the gusto now 
This is so radically transforming. And in verse uh, 12, Paul says on the positive side, it instructs me to live sensibly. Have you heard that word before? We've seen it twice already in Titus 2. And so that's why I'm saying this whole thing is connected. Is it's going to teach you how to have self-control, how to control yourself. Because it's common, it's, 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 it's teaching me to deny those things, but to do this, to live righteously. And, and in Matthew 5 through 7, we spent a year looking at what true righteousness looks like when we know God and He's our Father and we live for Him. I, I seek true righteousness and I seek godliness to look to God and to look to His authority in my life. So what this instructs me to do is a new pattern of holiness a new way of living, a new way of life, living in light of a God who has sent His Son personified grace to bring salvation to me. It teaches me about the future. What's your view of future? Is, is the passing of time going to make things better? Is that your hope? Just maybe I'll get a job, things will get better, this trial will go away. What is it? Is it a blessed hope of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? These truths have to change the way we live. It's the only way you're ever going to be a Titus II man or woman that we've been studying. These truths are going to make you into that kind of man or woman. And this is how we're going to put on display a saving God because He saved us. And we, we're, we're caught up in those advents and we're denying ungodliness and worldly desires. That's when the world's going to take note of who we are. This is how we'll put a saving God on display. We live differently in light of his two appearings. And he says in verse 14, he gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. It makes you zealous for good deeds. So that, are you zealous for good deeds? That's what he's saying this should do, this, this blessed hope of him coming back, is it, it makes you zealous to want to live right, godly, holy for God. And, and that's the tightest two relationships that we've looked at, is that's good deeds in this context. So if, if you just keep finding reasons why you're not going to do it, it's not these appearings making you say, I'm going to lose my life to love others till I die. I'm going to overcome my flesh and I'm going to give myself and deny myself and labor into the, into the saints of God to help them grow into the image of God. Are, are you zealous for good deeds? I, I don't like answers that are apathetic to good deeds. This is too beautiful. that it, he, he literally came and he brought salvation. I just, I just don't understand giving him apathetic deeds. Does, does, ha, just before God, has it made your heart want to lose your life for the king who gave his life for you? That's what this is to bring about. Zealous for good deeds. It'll make a, a shy lady stand up at a pulpit and share with you about Titus 2 for women. That, she wouldn't have done that if Christ didn't appear. She would have sat there with her husband scared in her seat. Zealous for good deeds. Martin Luther said this, I live as if Christ died today. I live as if he was raised today. And I live as if he's coming back today. That was a man zealous for good deeds who's changed the world as we know it because he finally got the first appearing of Christ and that he brought the salvation that he was trying to merit and earn. And that this king is going to come back and establish his own that's what the Reformation was built on. That's what set that man's heart on fire. So these are the truths that these Advents will produce Titus II. And we must be taken up with Jesus Christ. We have to be able to say, for me to live, if I get life, it's Christ. And if I die, it will be gain. I will get more of this sweet Christ. I, I can't wait for that. And in that, we will be a people who will be zealous for good deeds, denying ungodliness and living sensibly and righteous and godly in this present age. So we're going to close out together at the communion table. And, this, and right now we get to remember 
but the grace of God has appeared. We're going to look at these elements, and they're going to remind us that, yeah, it appeared, and it, it actually, his body literally was broken, and his blood was literally spilled out for me. And so we, we get to remember that now. And Paul says, as he's describing this, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So communion is this picture of two advents. And we come and we remember this advent that the grace of God appeared and what it brought. And then while we're drinking and eating together, we're, we're putting our focus on and it's going to come again and it's going to make all things new. And we, we, we're unified and one in our hope. Come Lord Jesus. So every time we do communion, I can't get over the first appearing Oh, could the second pairing be right now? Let's remind each other, Maranatha, that's our hope. That's what we're looking for as a church. May he come. And so may we this morning look at the two advents of, of, of the coming of Christ and his second coming in such a way that it stirs our hearts to be zealous for good deeds. I'm going to give myself to this body and for its building up into the image of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the word of God. I have seen this passage so many times and never had it in its context. Oh God, the beauty of its context gives life to Titus relationships. Lord, I thank you that, uh, that grace appeared. Lord, that word is so beautiful to our hearts. It really came, he really came to earth and it appeared and it brought salvation to us. Oh God, all who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. I thank you that he came as a lamb. And I thank you that he's going to come again in unveiled glory. And he will consume his adversaries. And he will reward those who are looking for the blessed hope, for those who are eagerly awaiting a Savior. God, I pray that we would be those, that we are so taken up with the promise of what is to come. We live in light of it. It affects the way we live right now. And both those advents instruct us. They teach us, God, to deny this ungodliness and worldly desires that characterize the world of people who can't see past the scene. And so, God, we are different. And I thank you that these advents preach to me to turn from these things that are anti-God, these things that are against what, what you have called you are and what you've established in your children. And so I pray, Lord, that we will keep our eyes fixed and that that will cause us to be zealous, to lose our lives for, for you and for one another, and that we'll care and love and pour into each other's lives, that each life in this room matters to each and every one of us. God, thank you for the glory and the beauty. And when we do this, the world will see that we have a saving God. Lord, I pray that you would bring in a harvest by the beauty of what will be manifested here of people who love the advents of Jesus Christ. And it's in that precious, sweet, glorious name that we do pray. Amen.